10 days, our, our presents are increasing around the tree each, each day. It's good. I haven't really started yet. I'm a Christmas Eve, last minute kind of a guy. Oh, help me, Lord. How many love Christmas? Robin said this phrase, party with Jesus. It's okay. They got quiet. <laughs> Is that legal? I mean, can we party with Jesus? Yes. We can, in a righteous kind of way. I mean, do you know how many festivals Israel had? Party like an Israelite? I'm just like a new t-shirt. Party like an Israelite. <laughs> What's your problem, man? You just need to party like an Israelite. <clears throat> Come on. What is this, a Jewish holiday? I've heard that phrase, right? Hey, if, if, if fun isn't part of your culture, you don't have heaven's culture in you. There's lots of fun in heaven. So we should be having fun at church. We're calling heaven to invade this earth, right? Heaven's not boring. That's not even what I'm speaking on, but we'll get going here. You guys enjoyed the Adore series so far? Adoration. Pastor Nate had such a good word last week. Pastor Mark opened up with such a solid word. And, and he, he had this big idea that's kind of the overarching idea for the series, and it's this, is that we become what we behold and adore. How many remember that? We become what we behold and adore. He said we don't have an adoration deficit. It's not that we don't know how to worship and adore. It's that we worship and adore the wrong things. Today, uh, we're going to look at what happens when we adore the Prince of Peace. There was kind of a theme with worship, and it was so powerful because it flows right in with this message. What happens when I fix my adoration on the Prince of Peace? King Jesus, how many know he is King Jesus? He is King Jesus, but he is also our Prince of Peace, amen? So let's stand together. I know you just got settled in, but let's stand together just for a moment. And I want us to read this scripture together. How many know that one of the keys, I'm gonna give you a few keys today, keys that unlock peace in your life. But how many know one of the keys is God's word? That if you fill your mind and your heart with the word of God, if you're in scripture regularly, it transforms the way we think, doesn't it? And so before we read the word, let's just prepare our hearts. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. Bring your word alive. It is your word that is infallible and full of truth, and it transforms the way we think. So we open our hearts to your word today both written and spoken. And Jesus, we want all that you have. We want all the peace that you have to offer. Holy Spirit, we want it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read this together. This is, a, this is a prophecy in Isaiah chapter nine. This is about the Messiah, Jesus. And this was uh, over 700 years before the birth of Christ. This prophecy was released. And let's read it. Try to read it together. We did pretty good first service. I think we can do better. How many know second service is more better at reading <laughs> than first service. I'm just trying to pick my words very carefully. I'm just kidding. Anyways, yeah. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Come on of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Come on, while you're still... While you're still standing, will you close your eyes just for a moment? Let's make some declarations. Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, you are wonderful. Jesus, you are our counselor. You are our everlasting father. Jesus, you are my prince of peace. We adore you this morning, Jesus. We adore you. Just begin to adore him for a second. God, we shift our adoration away from our problems and onto you, our Prince of Peace. We adore you, Jesus. 
We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for all of the life you've given us, all of the blessings you've given us. We adore you, Jesus. We adore you. Thank you that you are our Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Do you feel that shift a little bit when you lift up the name of Jesus, when you read the truth about who he is? Make those declarations. I love it. Today's big idea is this, if you're taking notes. My adoration of Jesus activates his peace in my life. My adoration of Jesus activates his peace in my life. Can I hear an amen? Awesome. We draw closer to that which we adore, don't we? When we adore the Prince of Peace, we draw closer to him. When we place Jesus at the center of our hearts and at the center of our lives, we cannot help but to receive his peace. And catch this this morning, proximity promotes peace. Proximity to Jesus promotes his peace in my life. The closer I walk with him, the more I adore him and worship him, the more his peace fills my soul. The soul is our mind and our will and emotions. I draw closer and become like him. Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you, right? And and we're encouraged, I believe, by Paul where he says, cast your cares, cast your cares on him because he cares for us, right? We're not designed to carry the weight of the world. Jesus carried the weight of the world for us and he nailed it to the cross. We're actually designed to cast the things that we worry about onto him. Amen? It's an invitation, and it's beautiful. So what is the challenge then? I just gave the solution intentionally before I talked about the challenge. There's challenges. And the challenge is this, is that every single one of us have dealt with fear that can lead to worry, and when left undealt with, leads to anxiety and worse. I've heard it said this way, that every single person is born into a battle. The battlefield that we're born into is the mind, our will, emotions, and our thoughts. That's the battlefield. And the battleground is fighting for our peace. The war is over our peace and confidence in God. It wants to wage war against our peace and confidence in God. When we we become followers of Jesus... That battle, I would suggest, doesn't go away. In fact, sometimes when we're followers of Jesus and we're, we go through seasons, it can feel like it intensifies. How many know what I'm talking about? Anyone who's ever been uh, healed miraculously, sometimes that ailment tries to come back and take hold again. And you have to remind that thing, no, I've just been healed by Jesus. You don't get to come back. Or people who've gotten baptized before and God's doing this work in their heart, all of a sudden something, some bad news will come up. There's a battle going on and every person is born into it. That's the challenge. Jesus is the Prince of Peace and Mighty God. And I think it would be accurate to say then that the devil is, is of course, the opposite of Jesus. He's the Prince of Darkness, the Prince of Fear, the Prince of Worry. Fear, worry, and anxiety, they're the fruit of his influence. My concern with the church today, and I wonder if some have accepted worry and anxiety as just a normal part of life. When Jesus, the Prince of Peace, actually defeated the Prince of Darkness. He he defeated all the fruit of the Prince of Darkness. Is it possible that part of the reason why anxiety and worry and fear have become so prevalent in the church is simply because we have accommodated it? We have at some point said, you know, it's okay for a believer to have these issues. We'll we'll medicate it. We'll try to control the symptoms and do the best we can and just just hang on until we get to heaven. You ever heard that before from someone who's really going through a hard, I'm just going to try to hang on until I get to heaven. Here's the problem with that. Every single one of us that are sons and daughters of the living God, we're believers, we're followers of Jesus, we're not called to hang on until we get to heaven. We are called to bring heaven to earth. We are called to pull down heaven and let it invade every part of our life, every part of our society. If something doesn't look like heaven yet, God's not done yet. I'm starting to preach. <laughs> I'm, Jesus said, our Father who is in heaven, like famous, like the Lord's Prayer, right? 
Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come. It's the invitation. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. How? On earth as it is in heaven. There's no fear, no anxiety, no worries. None of that is in heaven. And so if there's something in my heart, in my mind, I got to call heaven to invade my heart. Flush that fear out in Jesus' name. Amen? I think it's time that maybe we can even start here at Life Church 7, that we take a stand and we say, worry, you're a trespasser. Anxiety, you're a violation of my design. I see the problem in front of me, but I'm going to deny it an influence over my life. My Jesus is bigger than my worries. Amen? All right. My Prince of Peace isn't the Prince of the Air. My Prince is the Prince of Peace. Amen? So, look, I might, I might have a problem. There's signs. There's possible signs that I might have some issues, right, with, with anxiety and worry. We, and many of us know those. I have gone through seasons where I've lost sleep where I've woken up in the morning at 3.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock every morning, every day, uh, nauseated, starting my day, not able to sleep through the night. I understand what worry and anxiety feels like. But you ever, you ever read those stories of, of people who have the weirdest coping mechanisms? Right? You, you know, like, you ever met a, a, a person who is like one cat away from officially becoming a crazy cat lady? I don't know why women have this, <laughs> this sort of thing, but it's like, oh, it's always the crazy cat lady, right? You ever met those people? It's like, you got to slow your roll on the amount of animals that you have, like, honestly. It's like a coping mechanism, though. And it's like, and, and, and you ever read those stories in the news, how there's like, there's like a, a public health safety hazard where the city has to come in and condemn the house, and they go in and find like, you know, because animals reproduce, right? So there's like 120 cats and 50 dogs and a squalor, and it's just unsafe. You ever read those stories before? Like, but honestly, it started as a coping mechanism. Like, I just, I, I, need, I need this animal. Well, I need to, oh, I felt good when I got that one. I'm gonna, and 40 cats later, we've got a serious problem here. I love a good meme. Anyone love a good meme online? I love, thank you for ordering the crazy cat lady starter kit. I mean, I, they are cute. I get it. I get it. <clears throat> cat lady trees ready for harvest. <laughs> Listen, and I want to talk, I want to talk about this with addiction. People have all kinds of coping mechanisms that become addictions. And joking aside, the moment I start to believe that I don't need that thing to cope is the moment I begin to find my freedom. The moment I believe that the blood of Jesus is more powerful than my addiction is the beginning of my breakthrough. My thoughts of worries. If my thoughts are worries and they consume my mornings when I wake up or at night, or if I lose sleep because of anxiety and my attention is so fixated on the problem and my worries, the reality is it has actually become adoration, hasn't it? Bill Johnson says it this way. He says, worship is, or worry is worship of the inferior. This was a huge breakthrough for me in dealing with anxiety and fear of public speaking and being scheduled to speak and kind of battling that thing. So I realized, you know what? I'm actually worshiping the wrong thing. I'm actually giving my attention and my adoration to something that's A, inferior, and it's not true. He also says this, fear is misplaced worship. And we're in an adoration series, and what we adore, we become. Amen? And so we take our adoration away from our problems, and we fix it on the Prince of Peace, and that's how peace floods our hearts floods our minds. So I want you to hear my heart this morning. You know, sometimes when we, here's the reality. Sometimes we can take our infirmity and make it our identity. I'm a worrier. Grandma Eunice was a worrier. Gladys, her mom, my great grandma was, a, I'm a generational worrier. We can actually make our infirmity our identity, right? And so when we speak the word of God and we speak the truth, we declare, and I'm, I'm here to suggest this morning that I'm not here that you would feel shame in this if, you, if you're on medication or anything like that. There's grace in that. But I'm here to just release freedom on you today. I'm here to release a new hope for you today. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, amen? 
He is the hope of the world. And my hope in his freedom is so much bigger than my problems that I face. Amen? So please hear my heart this morning. This is an invitation for freedom, not shaming if, if, we, if we are currently going through any, any struggles. But maybe my struggles, and I know for me personally, with worry and anxiety have unintentionally or even unknowingly been born out of adoration or worship of the inferior. But the truth of the matter is, there is nowhere in Scripture where Jesus or Paul, Peter, James, or John, or any of the writers of the New Testament, nowhere does it give a follower of Jesus permission to allow worry, anxiety, and depression to fill our hearts and minds. Nowhere. Nowhere in Scripture do we have permission to be worriers. So as we read the truth of God's word, we'll look at, uh, how many are ready for some keys? I need some keys. So I've described the challenge, right? We know the answer is the Prince of Peace, but there's these keys in Scripture on how we fight, how we are able to overcome worry. You ready for them? Let's do it. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus addresses worry here, and there's, I'm going to talk about three keys to defeat it. To defeat it. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Verse 25. That is why I tell you, this is letters in red here. This is Jesus himself. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Underline that in your scripture if you have that. Not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? That's literally like most of cable television, isn't it? (laughs) <laughs> food and what to wear and what not to wear, and, right? If we took those things away, most of cable television would be gone. It'd just be hunting and sports, and that would be okay. <laughs> We've got enough food channels, people. But look, he says, do not worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them, and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Underline that. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look, look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So Jesus connects worry with lack of faith. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of who? Unbelievers. And here's the first key. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. The first key to breakthrough in worry is to recognize and believe that my heavenly father already knows all my needs before I know I need them. And he's good. I know that he's good. Because he's good, he's gonna meet my needs. We have to recognize that and believe that. That is the first key to defeating worry. He knows my needs before I know it. And then it says in verse 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. So sometimes when we're walking through this life and a trial presents itself, something comes up, we receive bad news, right? My wife and I, we had this interesting discussion as I was preparing for this message and we were talking about worry and she said, you know, worry is really dreaming in the wrong thing. How do you know that we're designed to dream with God? And when we start to worry, we start to dream. Listen to this. When we worry, we dream with the spirit of fear. So seek, so listen, when we receive bad news, when there's something that we have the the ability to go one way or the other, seek first the kingdom of God. Let me me explain something the way that looks. Public schools, right? There is a war. How many, remember I said, we enter into a battle the moment we're born. There is a battle right now for the hearts and minds of our children in America. They're, They're presenting the most, lunatic, like, what do you call it? Curriculum. To try to influence our children, starting at the ages of kindergarten. California is in a battle right now. 
Now, I can take that information, I can read some of the insanity that they're trying to influence my child with, and I can start to worry and dream about how far this is gonna go. And oh my word, the public schools are too far gone, they're lost. Or I can seek first the kingdom and I can start to dream, what would it look like if parents caught a vision for revival in our public schools? What would it look like if more and more young adults got their degrees and infiltrated the schools and began to speak life over the kids and actually looked at it more than a career? It's my mission. What would it look like? See, I'm dreaming. God, what would it look like? Holy Spirit, how could I pray against certain schemes of the enemy? Who are the politicians that you want to put in place that will protect the values that are dear to your heart? That's dreaming with the kingdom instead of worrying. So seek first the kingdom of God instead of going right to that spirit of fear and worry. And then he says this, and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Live righteously. Make decisions based on what Jesus would do. Be obedient. Man, if I have stress and worry over my finances and I'm still not tithing, I'm not living righteously. I'm not living according to the word. I'm not being obedient with my finances. How many stresses come about by our own poor decisions? I can tell you I've had a bunch of them. Made my life difficult because I wasn't living righteously in an area and it wreaked havoc. So live righteously. When we obey God, there's this beautiful blessing that is unlocked and it has to do with peace. The enemy can't rob our peace, amen? All right, so we're gonna keep going. Paul in Philippians, if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter four, verse four. Paul addresses anxiety and he gives us four keys to defeat anxiety. And worship team, if you could come up, please. That'd be great, thank you. Philippians chapter four, verse four says this. Rejoice in the Lord when I feel like it. Rejoice in the Lord when my bank account is where I want it to be. How often are we supposed to rejoice in the Lord? Always. Rejoice in the Lord, always. I will say it again. I, Paul is putting emphasis. I will say it again. Rejoice. Amen. In verse five, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. So first we have Jesus in Matthew 6 saying, do not worry about anything. Now we have Paul saying, do not be anxious about anything. We do not have permissions as believers to live a life full of worry and anxiety. You cannot find it in scripture. It's actually the opposite. But in every situation, and it's the first key, it's that seeking first the kingdom. Go right to prayer and petition. And number two, turn our complaining to thanksgiving. There's something in your life you can be thankful for instead of complaining about. And the second we take our minds off the complaints and we are thankful for even a little thing, our hearts begin to shift. The Prince of Peace begins to come in and take hold. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, key number one, pray about everything. Number two, with thanksgiving, have a thankful heart that shifts everything, especially if you're fighting off depression. What am I thankful for? This is the way I feel, but I'm gonna rejoice because God, you've given me breath. You've given me a beautiful wife, an amazing family, an amazing job. Whatever it is, just start to give thanksgiving. Number three, present your request to God. That's the third key, talk to him. He's so close. Do you know that the, the, the word says that he's close to the brokenhearted? Sometimes as pastors, we receive some of the worst news that we never, we get the phone calls we don't wanna get because people that we dearly love are walking through difficult, difficult things, heavy stuff. And our heart has to be guarded against heaviness. I say, Jesus, what do you say about this situation? And here's what I know. Even in the most difficult situations, he actually comes close. He is so close. And I've seen people walk through these situations and come out the other side with their hands raised, worshiping because they sense his presence is so close. If we go with fear and anxiety and anger and all these other things that wanna rob us of our peace, it will go there, our hearts will go there. Present your request to God, talk to him, he's so close. Tell him how you feel. Here's the situation, God, I don't like this, but what do you say? But what do you say? Philippians 4, 
8 continued, finally, finally, brothers and sisters, and it's the fourth key in this Philippians passage. And it's the point, the key is this, shift your adoration. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Other trans, um, translations say, meditate on these things. Let these things fill your heart and mind. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And what's the promise? And the peace, and the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. Shift my adoration, moving my adoration and worship away from the problem to my Prince of Peace. Will you stand with me this morning, please? I want to go back to the big idea for a moment. And it's this my adoration of Jesus activates his peace in my life. My adoration of Jesus activates his peace in my life. The Lord just led me to the story of David. And I was, I was trying to remember, did David defeat Goliath when he was already king? And I was, I was kind of going through the timeline in my mind. And I said, I want to go back and reread this story. And, and I went back, and, and the progression goes like this. So David is out in the field. His father overlooks him. Samuel comes to the household of Jesse. He says, one of your sons is going to be king. He doesn't even call David to the party. Not even welcome. Samuel says, nope, none of these are king. You got one more. Who is it? Calls for David. David comes in. Samuel anoints him with oil. This is the next king of Israel. And the word says that the spirit of God falls upon him. This anointing from heaven falls upon him. That's key for the, for the New Testament believer. And we'll get to that in a minute. The very next chapter, Saul is being tormented by a spirit. It's a spirit of torment. And he's losing his mind. Here's this powerful man that once was this powerful, confident leader of Israel, and he started to believe lies about himself. And if you look at the story of Saul, it's insecurities and believing the wrong thing and worshiping the wrong thing that steers his heart away from God. And all of a sudden, he's starting to believe things that aren't true, and the Spirit becomes, he's opened the door, and the Spirit begins to torment him. And the answer is, he calls David, I need someone who can worship. So he calls this worshiper in, David, who's got the anointing of God on his life, and he comes in, and just starts to play the harp. And the spirit that is tormenting him flees, has to go. In the presence of God, the tormenting spirit has to leave. And there's this thing that worship does in our heart when we're adoring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that sends tormenting spirits away. I was talking to my cousin Nick last night after, after prayer and he was saying, there's seasons, it's a, he read in this book where it's called the spirit of insanity. And if you've walked through depression, you understand this. It feels like you're losing your mind. And, and Nick said, you know, it's so powerful because I learned that I have to put on a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. When I surround my heart with a garment of praise, that spirit has to go. And I've received so much breakthrough in my life when I put on a garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. And it's the same thing David is doing here. He's playing the harp with a garment of praise. And Saul, even though he believes all this nonsense, is, is, is relieved. There's this relief that comes over him. As he was sharing that with me, I was like, ooh, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> He's like sharing his testimony. It's so powerful. But it's that spirit of insanity that wants to come against you. So then the progression goes from there where he, he, he brings some food to his brothers that are on the, the front lines and they're about to fight the Philistines and Israel has this battle about ready to happen. And then there's this giant that comes out. You remember the story, it's Goliath. And I caught something that I've never seen before when I read this story again. The Bible says that Israel was about ready to go and destroy the giant and the Philistines. But then one man comes out, this big gnarly dude, right, comes out and starts speaking stuff. And the Bible says that he, that he said, why, no, 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 how about instead of going to war, why don't you send one of your men out and we'll fight one on one. And that's what fear and anxiety does. Catch this, it starts to define the terms in your life. Israel could have gone in and wiped out Goliath. They wouldn't have needed David. They started to listen to the enemy. 
Anxiety says, you don't get to have a good night's sleep tonight. I'm defining the terms in your life. Fear says, no, you don't get to go and have a good relationship with that person because you're terrified of them. And what does David say? He walks out with the anointing of the, of, and the fire of God on him. He says, who is this? I don't care how big he is. Who is this uncircumcised pagan Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? Who is that? He's like an early teenager. He's like in his early teens. He's a young man. In fact, Saul calls him a boy. He goes, you're a boy. What are you, what are you gonna do? But he has so much confidence in who God is. And in, in Psalms 34, Pastor John brought this up this week, and it was, I looked at Psalms 34, it's so good. And it's David. Oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. Magnify the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace, right? Not the giant. Israel magnified this giant and made him too big to overcome. God never said fight him one-on-one. -on -one. He did. How many of us face fears and anxiety where we have bowed to the, right, to the rules and the, of engagement with fear and worry and doubt? And the Spirit of the living God is here to fill your heart. You can look at that worry and say, you know what, I've carried this in 2019 and I'm not gonna carry it into 2020. Today is gonna be the day that I, that anxiety, we're gonna sing about this in a moment where anxiety bows at the name of Jesus. I'm going through a health crisis, but God is good, and he wants to heal me. I'm not gonna end this way. Right before the first service, before I came up and started, started to speak, I just had a flashback to, I don't know, like five years ago-ish. My grandpa, John, my, my dad's dad, was 84, and my grandma had already passed away a few months before. They were married for like over 60 years. And I remember being in his room. And he was, he was full of God's word. Full of hymns and full of God's word. And he, was, and he would quote scripture and he would talk about scripture. He'd sit down with him and actually my grandpa Oscar and him got in the same room. They'd preach towards each other and back and forth. And it was like, it was like a lot of glory in the room. It was amazing. But my grandpa, John, I just remember this. He had cancer at the end of his life. And, and he had owned a business, a successful logging business. He had paid for a property and he, he, he passed down a wonderful inheritance to his four boys. But at the end of his life, he was sitting in his, in his care facility. And I remember being in that room, just talking with him. And all he had in his room was a couple changes of clothes, his Bible over on the nightstand, and he had a CD and a CD player of the Bible on CD. And he just had the Word of God playing in his room. And I'm telling you, he's, he's facing the last couple weeks of his life. But there was such a peace in that room. And one morning he gets up, goes to use the restroom, and he slips into eternity. And there was so much peace in that room. No stress, no fretting. I finished the race. I served well. I'm ready for my reward. Because the peace of God fills his heart, even in the face of death. That's not the end. It's the beginning of our new life. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to worship. Pastor West is going to close in just a moment. But as we worship... I want the Holy Spirit to highlight in your heart and in your mind, what am I going to refuse to take with me into 2020? What have I carried for in 2019, 18, 17? Maybe it's decades you've carried certain things. Uh, Francis Frangipane says this, says, any area of my life that is not glistening with hope is under the influence of a lie. Any area of my life that isn't glistening with hope is under the influence of a lie. How many want truth? <laughs> so good. Let's worship together. Pastor Russ will be up here in just a few moments. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Peace is a promise to me. Thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Prince of Peace, it's impossible to have the peace that passes all understanding without knowing the Prince of Peace. I just want to give this open-eyed invitation. Man, you never want, you don't have to close your eyes 
and nobody looking around. It's really the most, it's the biggest upgrade that you'll ever experience of asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. It's just so good. Yeah. If you're here this morning and you haven't made Jesus your Prince of Peace, would you just raise your hand and just say, today? Yeah, amen. Others? The Prince of Peace is here. In the balcony, there's, yeah, amen. We're gonna just lift our hands to the Lord. Yeah. Anyone else like to raise their hand and just say, I, today I wanna receive the Prince of Peace. The one who passes the peace of passes all understanding. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So those that are just close right here, would you just place your hand on her? Yeah. And um, we're just going to pray together. So would you just repeat this prayer with me? Thank you, Father. Yeah. Make it perfect. So Heavenly Father, this is all the church. I want you to just all repeat with me, Lord Jesus. I thank you being my peace, Prince of Peace. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, to be my Lord and Savior. Today, I repent, I turn from my sin, and I turn to a Savior. His name is Jesus. And Jesus, I receive you. In your precious name. So as the prayer partners come, those that raise your hand to receive Christ, I would love to meet with you. We have prayer partners who are coming quickly. And I just, I, I want, you may have come in one way, but you can't leave the same way if you need freedom. Amen? It is for freedom that Christ has made us free. And if you're here today and you just go, you know, I'm, I'm struggling at home, I'm struggling. Um, I'm struggling with anxiety. Um, man, we've had lots of that in my own family. And what Pastor Drew spoke about is absolutely true. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And we have people who were trained who will pray with you and we're going to believe and stand with you that it is for freedom that Christ has made us free. So if you struggle with anxiety, anxiousness, fear, anything that's going on, anything that actually isn't what we're supposed to carry, we want to pray with you and believe the Lord just to bring freedom and wholeness. We don't ever want people to go off of their medications until they've gone and talked to a doctor and made sure that um, what you have sensed, your healing uh, from the Lord is true. Amen? So we always want to use good wisdom. And there's no condemnation. Well, I just don't want people, I want a brother or a sister to pray with me and agree with me because I want to just be free from this. So we just come to a, a place of love and kindness and confidence. We just pray and stand together. And whatever you need, God has a bit. If you need healing this morning, we had people healed this week. It's just amazing. So I'm going to pray and bless each one of you. And if you'd like prayer, come. And we'll stay here and we'll pray with you. So Father, I thank you for today. Would you just lift your hands? I want to bless you. I bless every person here this morning. Lord, I ask that the peace of God would rest upon every heart, every life. Make your face to shine upon each one. Lord, I ask that you'd be gracious to each one. Lift up each countenance. And Lord, Aaron prayed, and give them peace. Lord, we see, we see that shalom of heaven, the peace of God. Father, we thank you for that now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. If you'd like prayer, we'd love to pray with you.